These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. What type of functional group is this? That is aldehyde. Right. What type of functional group is this? These don't have to be the same carbon chains, just a carbon chain on both sides. There's also a special name for just the carbon-oxygen double bond. Carbonyl. That's right. The carbon-oxygen double bond is called the carbonyl. So we can see that there are a lot of particular carbonyl-containing compounds. Carbonyls can appear in many different types of functional groups. Aldehyde is a carbonyl connected to an alkyl group and a hydrogen. Remember we saw last semester that alkyl groups are carbon chains. And a ketone is a carbonyl attached to two alkyl groups, two carbon chains. By the way, just as a, a minor detail, we might have briefly seen last semester. Aldehyde. Yeah, this is also considered an aldehyde, and you remember the name formaldehyde, even though it only had, even though it doesn't have any carbon chains. This is just a special type of aldehyde, which as you said is formaldehyde. But otherwise, the aldehydes are an alkyl group and a hydrogen. And we're studying all of those together because for the most part, aldehydes and ketones have the same reactivity. Most of the things that we'll say for aldehydes are true for ketones and vice versa. Well, what's interesting about aldehydes and ketones, one thing that's interesting about them is that they have an electrophilic atom. Well, what's the electrophilic atom in an aldehyde or a ketone? The carbon that's slightly uh, positive. Good. And it's good that you gave the reason. The reason that this, uh, so which carbon is it? The carbonyl carbon. The best name for this would be the carbonyl carbon. Uh, the best name for this is the carbonyl carbon. Uh, and you gave the correct reason for why it's an electrophile. This is the same logic we went through last term. It has a delta positive charge because it's connected to something more electronegative than it. And we know that carbons with delta positives can act as electrophiles. So basically, I think the only thing you've been covering this week, and maybe for most of next week too, is just all the different nucleophiles that can attack a carbonyl carbon. And unfortunately, there's a bunch of different patterns. So you have to learn all the different patterns of nucleophiles that can attack the carbonyl carbon. So we'll try to do that in an organized way. Well, this is the basic pattern. We have a nucleophile that attacks the carbonyl carbon, but the carbonyl carbon already has a complete octet, so at the same time that the nucleophile attacks, this pi bond must move away to make room. The pi bond is almost like, like it's acting like a leaving group. No, not really, but it's acting like a leaving group that makes room for the nucleophile that's coming in. The oxygen doesn't leave because it's still connected by the sigma bond, but it's still kind of acting in that way. Then we could draw an intermediate that looks like this. And we know that we usually don't end up with final products that have charges. So usually there would be some kind of step that would put a proton on here. We won't go into the details right now. But oftentimes this would be our final product. And I think it's a good idea when you draw where the nucleophile is, rather than drawing the nucleophile down below, it's a good idea to draw it up here, because I think that makes it clearer that the nucleophile has replaced one of the pi bonds on the carbonyl carbon. So I like to put it in the same place as the carbonyl oxygen to show that it's replaced one of those pi bonds. That'll help us. Here's another notational trick that's going to turn out to be really useful to us. It's very useful throughout these problems to keep track of the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. 
or to keep track of the atoms that used to be the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. After all, notice this oxygen doesn't look like the carbonyl oxygen anymore, right? But it's very important for solving problems to recognize that it used to be the carbonyl oxygen. So I'm going to put an asterisk next to the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. If you add another OH, you might get confused with like... Yes, that's one good reason to do that. That's one good reason to do that. And by the same token, the carbonyl carbon doesn't look like a carbonyl carbon anymore, so the asterisk helps us to remember that it used to be the carbonyl carbon. Why is it so important to remember that it used to be the carbonyl carbon? Well, as we go along, we'll see why it's so useful to keep that in mind. Now, this is what we could call a category one type product. I was mentioning a second ago that there's many different patterns of nucleophilic attack on carbonyls. And unfortunately, this is only one of the categories. And now we have to look at a couple of the other categories. Um, now, the, the other category, category two, is now in, in pretty much any of the nucleophilic attacks, we always have these steps happen first. We always have these steps happen first. However, in many cases, there's more stuff that happens. Sometimes we just stop at category one, but sometimes we have more stuff that happens. One of the main things that could happen is another nucleophilic atom could attack this carbon. Um, after all, is this still electrophilic? Yes. Yeah, it's still electrophilic. Why is that? Because it's partially positive. That's right. Also, it's possible to make this into a leaving group that will leave, and that will put a okay. full positive charge here, and then it would be a great electrophile. So for both those reasons, we still have an electrophile here, so a second nucleophilic atom could attack. And that would give us a product that looks like this. Now we have two nucleophilic atoms that attack. You can see that right now we're not worrying about the mechanism. We're just trying to get the basic pattern, and we'll go through the mechanism shortly. Now here's where it becomes very difficult to remember who used to be the carbonyl carbon. So I want to keep putting in an asterisk, because it doesn't even have an oxygen anymore. So if we don't put in the asterisk, we're going to forget who was the carbonyl carbon, but we'll see it's very important not to forget that. So we'll keep putting in that asterisk. Now, what we're trying to do now is look at things in very general terms. So I'm just using the, the NU for nucleophile, but in a specific case, these might be oxygens or nitrogens, say, or even sometimes carbons, depending on the particular pattern. Um, but we have two nucleophilic atoms that have attacked here. Now, what happened to the carbonyl oxygen? Well, it must have left completely now to make room. Notice that in order for the first nucleophile to attack, we have to break the pi bond to the oxygen to make room. But in order for the second nucleophilic atom to attack, we would have to break the sigma bond to the oxygen. So it's gone and floated off. Um, how did it float off? What might have floated off is hydroxide, or more commonly, as water. So this must have left as either hydroxide or more commonly as water. So it does not left as a leader, so you would probably add like a proton to make it. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, that's the exact right analysis. We'd probably add a proton to make it a better leaving group. However, unfortunately, um, last semester we said that um, a neutral oxygen that leaves as O minus is a, a bad leaving group. However, even last semester we saw one exception where it could be a leaving group. And actually, this semester we're going to see a bunch of cases where you can have a neutral oxygen as a leaving group. But you have to have a good reason for that still. Um, so sometimes it can leave as hydroxide. But you're still correct that it's usually going to leave as water. So we'll see both of these patterns. And now I should put the asterisks here. Now these really don't look like carbonyls anymore, so it's very important to put in the asterisk to remember this is what's left of the carbonyl oxygen over here. And we'll see later why it's so important to keep track of that. Well, this is what we could call category two when we end up with this type of product. So category two is when two separate nucleophilic atoms attack. And category one is when only a single nucleophilic atom attacks once. So here's two of our patterns. And again, for the most part, we haven't shown a lot of the steps. We're just showing the products. We'll go through the steps soon. In particular, we're leaving out a lot of the protonations and deprotonations. There's one more very important category. Let, let's go back to here. Instead of having a second nucleophilic atom attack, it's possible that the original nucleophilic atom could attack a second time. And that might be what you just started to look at when you looked at nitrogens yesterday. So this would be our category three. What if this nucleophile over here simply attacks a second time? Maybe it uses a lone pair to attack a second time. Well, then we would get a product that looks like this. Yeah. And again, this used to be the carbonyl carbon, so I'll asterisk. So this is what we call category three. Category three is when the same nucleophilic atom that attacked the first time uses a lone pair to attack a second time. 
we can see that in some ways that's similar to, and in some ways it's different from category two. So this is not an intermediate for here. We just went from here to here in this case. Or for category two, we would go from here to here. And again, we're leaving out a bunch of the steps. Now again, in order for this to happen, we had to kick off the oxygen to make room. So again, it would have left as hydroxide or water. So again, the oxygen would have left here as hydroxide or water, just like it did in this case. So that would be our category three. So the main categories are a single nucleophilic atom attacks once, category one, or two separate nucleophilic atoms attack, or a single nucleophilic atom attacks twice. That would be category three. If you were just going over nitrogens yesterday, that was a category three reaction. Uh, but the reason I'm not just putting a nitrogen here is that you're going to see a couple other types of atoms that go through that same pattern. So we want to have a general idea that there's a, a bunch of different atoms that can go through that pattern. 